It's wonderful to now be sharing this experience of having you on the Super Data Science Podcast. And just so that the audience knows, it sounds like I might be being nepotistic, but you will very quickly see that Brett Tully on his own merit absolutely deserves to be here. He's an extraordinary human being. Young, ambitious, excited people can get together and, and, and genuinely change meaningful things is, is such a, an exciting yeah. thing. So Nemap's a, a location intelligence company. Uh, it was founded a bit more than a decade ago uh, over in Perth here in Australia. Brett Tully, welcome to the Super Data Science Podcast. I can't believe we're on air together. It's awesome. I've known you for a very long time, coming on 15 years. Uh, so we met at Oxford. We were doing PhDs at the same time. and. For some reason, we didn't mind spending a lot of time with each other. We lived together for several years in different locations as roommates on campus, off campus. Uh, you actually, it was through you that I got my first job in New York after my PhD. Um, so a lot of connections. Uh, yeah, it's wonderful to now be sharing this experience of having you on the Super Data Science Podcast and just so that the audience knows, it sounds like I might be being nepotistic, but you will very quickly see that Brett Tully on his own merit absolutely deserves to be here. He's an extraordinary human being. So Brett, welcome to the show. How are you going, mate? And where in the world are you? Mate, thank you very much for having me on. It's uh, it's awesome just to catch up. But uh, but yeah, great to be able to, to chat a little bit about what I've been up to for the last little while. So I am coming to you from uh, from Sydney. So morning my time, even, evening your time. And uh, yeah, yeah, excited to nice. be here. And also winter my time in New York, but summer yeah. your time on the other side of the planet. Yeah, although we're in the midst of a week of rain. So summer is uh, inverted commas at the moment. Mm, well, I'm sure it's picking up. Um, so you work at a firm called Nearmap, and actually we, in a somewhat tangential way, you are not the first Nearmap uh, employee on the show. So in episode 455, we had Horace Wu, who works in the legal department at Nearmap, but we were actually in his episode, we were focused uh, entirely on his entrepreneurial business, which is a legal AI um, uh, technology company. So we didn't really talk about NearMap at all. So Brett, start us off by telling us what NearMap is. Yeah, so, so NearMap's a, a location intelligence company. Uh, it was founded a bit more than a decade ago uh, over in Perth here in Australia. Um, and it was founded really as, as an aerial imagery company. So based around uh, some really cool IP for camera systems, uh, which means that you could uh, basically fly planes higher and faster than what other people were doing in the industry. Um, and that kind of drastically dropped the, the amount of money it would take to, to actually capture the imagery. And so uh, the company kind of changed the model of that and, and moved from this, this idea where uh, customers would, would call up the, the company and ask for a particular location to be flown and captured and then delivered, sometimes even months later. Um, what NIMAP does is we, we fly everywhere uh, and we process and then we figure out how to sell it and we sell it like a subscription. So uh, really, really interesting technology company in the sense that uh, you know, we're based in the middle of Sydney uh, in one of the, the high rises um, right there on the harbour. Uh, but in that office, we're building camera systems. Uh, we're figuring out how to fly planes all across uh, Australia, New Zealand, US, Canada. Um, and then we, we own the, the stack all the way from kind of turning that source imagery from the planes uh, into uh, what we call a, a, a tiled map. Um, so using using kind of, uh, I guess, maybe what listeners your listeners would call uh, old school computer vision um, to do photogrammetry. Um, but then on top of that, we, we have all sorts of um, derived content as well. So we're building uh, massive scale 3D representations of, of the urban world uh, cool. and then uh, what, what my team is involved in is, is taking that input data, running uh, kind of modern vision algorithms on top of that and really starting to, to dig into the detail of, of what the human urban experience actually looks like. Wow, so clearly from end to end, NearMap has a ton of technology involved in uh, image capture and just 
like getting the planes up and fast to be doing this image capture all the way through to the machine vision piece that you're working on. Um, so tell us about that. You are called the director of AI output systems. What does that mean? What is an AI output system? Yeah, so the, the way that uh, Mike Buley, my boss, uh, set up AI at Nearmap, I think is really interesting. So uh, the group is called AI Systems. Uh, and within that, we have three different kind of teams. Uh, so mine is AI Output Systems. Uh, and we'll come back to what that means uh, in a little bit. Um, but the other two are the Model R&D team and the Model Systems team. And you can loosely think about those two um, teams, the first being responsible for uh, really the nuts and bolts of um, the deep learning algorithms that we are developing and the architectural design uh, mm -hmm. and the the big sort of forward thinking pieces, you know, the types of, of projects that take uh, months, if not longer, to um, to really come to fruition. Uh, and then the model systems team is, is responsible from... Uh, basically everything to do with, with label data gathering, uh, managing things like the ontology of, of our labels. Um, mm. I think we are one of the, the first, certainly one of the first companies I've heard of um, that has just hired an AI ontologist. Uh, so oh, a full-time yeah. role just uh, devoted to managing the growing complexity of our semantic um, knowledge graph uh, and the, the label definitions. Uh, and they they kind of they they're building systems that that take all that labeled data, uh, look after it in the right way, uh, and then set up the the infrastructure for training our deep learning models. So that uh, and probably that. many of our listeners are probably already familiar with this idea of labeling, but just in case someone isn't, so you have all of this aerial imagery, and it's just pixels. It, it doesn't have any uh, meaningful human structure. Um, and so you can apply labels and you can use machine vision algorithms maybe to help with labeling in certain circumstances. Uh, but so you could have things like, um, you know, an airport is probably in this region. I don't know, I'm making up examples. You'd have better ones than me, but you could have labels of, okay, you know, this kind of pixel looks like an airplane. This kind of uh, pixel looks like a car, um, that kind of thing, right? Yeah, that's exactly right. So we're up to, I think, just uh, just above about 110 different layers of semantic meaning now um, oh, in our label wow. data. Uh, and from that, by the time it comes through my team and into to data that's kind of ready for customers, we're, we're well above 250 attributes um, that are sort of representing the, the urban physical world. Um, and the, the structure of that can be can be quite deep and quite complex. So um, yeah, we can we can mark pixels that belong to a roof or a building, um, but then at the same time we can also say what that roof is made out of, or what the shape of the roof is, and, oh, and what the condition man. of that roof is. Oh, um, so you can start to see that this this kind of nested hierarchy of um, of, of semantic meaning, uh, which mm -hmm. we can then start to apply. Super cool. This episode is brought to you by Super Data Science, our online membership platform for learning data science at any level. Yes, the platform is called Super Data Science. It's the namesake of this very podcast. In the platform, you'll discover all of our 50 plus courses, which together provide over 300 hours of content, with new courses being added on average once per month. All of that and more you get as part of your membership at Super Data Science. So don't hold off, sign up today at www.superdatascience.com. Secure your membership and take your data science skills to the next level. Yeah, so the model R&D team, the model systems team, and the output systems team that you direct, all three of those roll up into the AI systems team. So you've told us a bit about model R&D, you've told us a bit about the model systems team. What does the output systems team do? Yeah, right. So, so we take as input uh, the, the deep learning model that's coming out of model R&D. Uh, and our kind of primary responsibility is, is taking that model and applying it across all of our imagery. So we have petabytes of, of aerial imagery in our back catalog going, going back more than 10 years in Australia. Um, and we are continually capturing. Uh, so we get ten, tens of thousands of, of square kilometers of, uh, of new imagery in each day. Uh, and as of this year, um, the company is committed to running 
uh, our AI platform uh, across every piece of imagery that we we capture. So um, the way we like to describe uh, what we do uh, when we're running inference is uh, we're effectively painting pixels with meaning. Mm -hmm. um, so for every pixel in in an image that we capture, uh, we have this you know collection of of attributes where we can effectively each pixel will represent a, a confidence that that um, that pixel is representing a, that particular attribute or that particular layer. So my team um, is effectively running a, a really complicated DAG or really complex DAG of operations where Directed we start acyclic graph. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, so so we start uh, we start with the the deep learning model and, and we yeah. we run our raster predictions, uh, so that you know that's our pixel wise predictions. Um, but at that point, the data is uh, is very flexible, um, but it can be quite difficult to work with. Uh, so, uh, in many ways, we're increasing the size of the data much beyond what you're getting just straight out of the camera. Uh, and for most of our customers, that's not really what they want. What they actually want is for us to identify objects in the world. Um, and so that kind of post-processing DAG uh, kind of then really kicks into gear where we we start to group pixels together. So, you know, in some senses, you can think of it as just thresholding pixels above a certain confidence, you know, taking a contour, and then that's an object. Uh, and, it, and that would kind of be the most naive thing that you could do. Um, but... Uh, we can start to think about ways of enhancing that data uh, as we move through the DAG. So um, if you think about things like uh, like roofing, um, you know, humans make roofs typically with straight lines and 90 degree angles. And so we have mm -hmm. a post-processing model that sits on top of that output, uh, which, you know, does things like a, a smarter version of simplification of those outlines. Um, and what's interesting there is that we start to move as much into the world of accuracy as we do aesthetics. Mm -hmm. um, and for, for some of our customers, the aesthetic of the output data that we produce is as important as, as anything else. What so, does that mean, the aesthetic? Well, so, you know, think of something like a, a, a simple, you know, simple suburban house is typically four walls and a roof. And those four walls typically are put together at 90 degree angles. And so if you were trying to represent that with a polygon, um, you would want that polygon to be a, a box with four corners and, and four straight lines. Yeah, um, if you start to have wiggles in that, then depending on how you're using that data as a customer in your application, um, that aesthetic can, can start to really impact on, on kind of the value of the data. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. So the so part of this post processing can be to clean up wiggles. <laughs> it can, absolutely, it can, yeah. 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 Um, and and in other ways, um, so we can we can kind of think of uh, what we're calling the vectorization part of our um, our algorithms. Uh, so where we go from raster to vector data, in many ways, is a, a data compression kind of approach. In that um, you can group many pixels into a single polygon and polygons are typically very lightweight um, but in other ways we're actually making the data much richer as well because uh, from a, a polygon we can also then start to to add additional attributes to that so things like area and um, I, I was listening to one of your uh, episodes um, the other day around um, uh, knowledge graphs for commercial real estate Oh, yeah. um, and our type of data fits kind of within a similar paradigm to that type of thing as well in the sense that, um, you know, we can start to do things like, say, this roof is made of this particular material. It has this shape. Uh, it has this area of solar panels on top of it. Um, and then because it's all geospatial, uh, you can start to apply geospatial algorithms on top of that as well. So you can start to talk about how far things are from other things. So. You know, how close is the nearest tree to this house? Um, and, you know, you, you can start to imagine all sorts of different customer applications that can be, um, can use that kind of information. Yeah, and I want to get to a specific case study in a moment, but just quickly, that episode that you were talking about with the knowledge graphs, that's episode 479 with Maureen Tessier. And that is an awesome episode if people would like to learn more about knowledge graphs. 
Um, but then in addition to that, there's a term that you've been using that I'm not super familiar with. And so I would love to understand better. Uh, you've used it a couple of times now, Rasta. How is like, yeah, what does that mean? So I, I don't know the the kind of etymology of the word, but but in in uh, so Rasta for us is basically pixel based information. Got um, it. Got it. Got so it. think of like a, a bitmap is considered a Rasta image, uh, whereas yeah. SVG is a is vector graphics. Uh, so right, that right, that's right, kind right. of the where the terminology comes from. Nice. Um, so most things like semantic segmentation are raster based operations they output a matrix of confidences for each pixel um so that that's that's kind of our raster set of algorithms and then the vectorization is when we t then turn that into uh effectively polygons and, and points cool i also i just remembered that uh at least uh back when we were living together you were really into photography you were an outstanding photographer and so did this did that draw you to this job at all or was that just kind of a bit of a bonus uh i think it drew me to the the world of machine vision um and right. just generally the yeah I, i've always found uh hard problems that are intuitive to me are more interesting than hard problems that are not intuitive to me um right <laughs> so yeah i always use quantum mechanics as my like counter example that is a hard <laughs> problem that i just don't get intuitively and i've have always found that really hard to to kind of fully understand, um, but yeah, I mean, Nearmap's awesome for that. I think half the camera, half the half the company are camera nerds, and um, yeah, in right. particularly in our sort of uh, in in the vision team, so the the kind of the teams that that sit a little bit upstream of us, um, there are some guys in there who who really get vision uh, and even down to like the neuroscience of what makes an image appealing so that you can set the color balance is correct and, and stuff like that. Like it's, it's really cool stuff. Cool. Yeah. That must be great for you. So, all right. So yeah, so that clears up the Rasta and vector uh, aspects to me. It's now crystal clear. Um, so yeah, we've, we've talked a little bit uh, abstractly about examples. I gave bad examples probably of like, oh, we can detect a plane, we can detect a car. And then you gave much better examples of like, this is a roof and we know it's a roof because it's on a polygon that's shaped like a house. And we can layer into that, that this roof, you know, um, you know, once I guess you've identified it's a roof, you can do further uh, post-processing to look for more information that you guys can classify about roofs in particular, like roof quality, uh, roof components, you know, what, what, what it's made out of. Um, so, you know, that kind of gives us a sense of generally speaking, what's possible with near maps type of machine learning algorithms, but do you have a case study you could share with us to bring this to life? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I guess the, the big thing that we're doing is, is we're producing, uh, what I would call data products. Um, and we're trying to build that as a platform so that we can serve multiple verticals, um, but the, the couple of big verticals that we're, we're really targeting with our stuff early on uh, around local governments uh, and insurance. Uh, and those needs are, are quite different. Um, but I have to say that the one that I, I didn't really expect uh, before I joined Nearmap and am constantly impressed by, by the use cases is in local gov. Um, the level of sophistication uh, in, in so many places around understanding the urban environment of the area that these teams are tasked to look after is just phenomenal. Wow. Um, so yeah, I, yeah. I definitely have the perception of a bunch of uh, people working very short hours on my hard earned tax dollars. Uh, so I'm glad I can to assure you it's, it's not that at all. And it's, <laughs> it's, it's genuinely, genuinely impressive. Um, everything from uh, modeling population growth to figure out where you should put schools, um, to, to looking at uh, how vegetation changes over time, um, which is uh, something that I'm, I'm yeah, I love seeing the, the approaches that, that these guys take. Um, I mean, not directly relevant to, to our data platform by any means, but, um, yeah, the city of Melbourne has literally catalogued every single tree in their local government area. Wow. Um, and it's just... And they, they can do that because of you or they could do it more easily because of you because someone doesn't have to walk around and count. No, so, 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 so that one in particular uh, is, is not 
uh, based off what we've done. That that's just something I, I presume they've sent out an army of people to literally <laughs> go and tag and and record locations and stuff like that. I, I think it's really interesting to to think about how that kind of work can get replaced with products like ours, um, and right. certainly um, as our kind of the the fidelity of our results uh, becomes more fine grained. Um, you can imagine a lot of that kind of manual, laborious work uh, yeah. can start to be replaced by by computers for sure. Sounds like an even better use of my tax dollars to be <laughs> exactly. having machines do it as opposed to needing to, humans always need to eat and sleep. So inconvenient, uh, so costly. Um, well, but then also, I mean, I'm kind of saying this in jest, but of course, by having more aspects automated, you can divert services to more high value tasks that only a human can do. Um, so. And I, I think just the the ability to do it at scale and to make that kind of knowledge um, discoverable is is something that often you can only do with machine dri driven approaches. Um, the the idea that you can uh, manually annotate what we can produce uh, basically by running big clusters on AWS uh, is is just fanciful. You you can't do that in a manual way. So. Um, I think right. where the really interesting applications come is is when you take uh, things or you take ideas that were previously not possible because we didn't have the ability to scale humans. Uh, yeah. Now, now we can scale the machine, and so what can you do with that data? Um, totally. And, and where do we go next? Like that. That's the really cool stuff. Yeah, because you know you could. It it sounds like you know somebody's paid in a city, you can pay some people to go and count all the trees in the city, but you can't count all the trees in Australia, but your system literally could. You could count every tree in Australia, every kangaroo that's out <laughs> loose, causing mayhem, um, <laughs> can be counted. Three that I saw system. just this morning. No, are you serious? <laughs> no. I'm oh, serious. no, you're joking. <laughs> uh, but yeah, um, no, you're exactly right. Like, I mean, it, it's... Um, it's not just within the realms of like possibility. We are actively doing things like that at the moment. Like we can, we can tell you every swimming pool in Australia. We can tell you every solar panel in Australia. And you start to think about uh, not only can we do that today, but you know, we've got a back catalog that goes back a decade. So we, we can show the growth in these things uh, in a way that isn't or hasn't really been possible previously. Um, and that's really exciting. Yeah, that is super cool. I just got reminded of a completely random side story, but uh, you know, I've never seen a kangaroo in the wild, but the only time that I was in Sydney, I saw a bat so large that I sprinted in fear and didn't realize that I'd lost my wallet. And then so I had to make my way from Sydney to Singapore without a wallet or cash. Uh, and so you guys do have some, some frightening animals over there. And it's actually, it's like one of the most dangerous places to live, right? Like, not because no, of dangerous coming in box. No, you don't have like dangerous fine. spiders and stuff. Oh, we've got plenty oh. of dangerous animals. Just don't touch them. <laughs> all right, all right. Okay, all right. So back to uh, the data science. So you uh, clearly with that case study, you're able to at near map, you're able to get way more output. You're able to scale up um, recognition of the physical world around us, whether it's in an urban center or a rural area with way less effort. Um, and you're able to do things that it would be impractical for humans to do uh, at any scale. So yeah, so we understand the scale of it. We understand the purpose of this. Uh, can you dig into, uh, can you dig in for us a bit more on exactly how the ML ops works? Like how do you generate this kind of vast scale of data? You mentioned AWS, but you know, more specifically, can you go into the kinds of software tools that you use in the cloud on a service like Amazon Web Services uh, to be able to generate this vast scale of data? Yeah, so I think one of the really interesting challenges for my team, you know, NIMAP is, is definitely a growth company. Uh, and so we need to care about, um, we, we need to think about generating data with a very small amount of our internal effort. We have to be thinking, you know, future-driven stuff. We're always working on the next features. We're always trying to build our next set of algorithms. Um, but at the same time, we we have to process this vast amount of data, uh, and so what we what we set out to do is is build a, a processing system um, 
that really let us generate, you know, 80% of our output with 20% of our effort, um, that kind of cliched breakdown. Um, but for me, I think this is, this is one of the really uh, interesting areas of, of MLOps that isn't really spoken about all that much. You know, if you read blog posts about what MLOps is, um, you know, there's got to be a lot of focus on experimental tracking, maybe some labeled data tracking. Uh, and then, you know, you've got your trained model and you throw it behind an API and then you want to monitor that in real time. Like that, that's ML ops um, by and yeah, large. Ma machine uh, learning yeah. operations. Yeah, that is. Yeah. And that's mostly like in my company, that is what it largely consists of. Yeah. Whereas I think for, for us, um, we want to reframe ML ops in terms of application architecture. So it's one thing to, to have a model that sits behind an API and it returns you some kind of probabilistic result. Um, but then someone's got to actually do something with that result. And for us, you know, we're, we're kind of in the world of geospatial um, intelligence, geospatial uh, numerics. Uh, and so there's a whole world of, of things that can go wrong uh, that are maybe not what you would think of just in terms of, of pure ML type stuff. So actually the, the model and running inference is a really small part of, of what we actually do. We build this entire system that sits around that. Um, and so uh, we've coined this term, or we haven't coined it, we, we use this term uh, pipeline of pipelines, uh, which is something that uh, kind of comes out of the DevOps vernacular. Uh, but for us, what it means is that, uh, so I, I mentioned before that we have this DAG of operations. Um, and we can think of each kind of module within the high level DAG as being a DAG of its own. Uh, so right. running inference across all of our imagery, um, you know, a particular capture from the aircraft might be a thousand square kilometers of data. Um, so just to run that, uh, run inference on that, we're looking at probably 400 hours or more of, of GPU compute time. Wow. In order to do that efficiently, we need to break that up into a bunch of you know, embarrassingly parallel tasks. Uh, and we then want to split that out across our compute in a way that, that makes sense. Um, and at that stage, you can no longer just think about the application layer. You also have to think about your compute layer as well. Um, and I guess in, in some sense, that's maybe not a new concept. Um, you know, if people are designing for Spark, they're writing their applications in a way that can run on Spark. For us, we're designing applications that can run on Kubernetes uh, and specifically using uh, a workflow orchestration tool called Kubeflow. Um, and uh, we've got some Kafka kind of thrown in there just to, to really round out the, the three Ks of, of um, <laughs> system engineering. Um, but yeah, so, so, so we have this kind of uh, what we can call like a controller pipeline. Uh, and that makes sure that all of these individual algorithms um, can be orchestrated sensibly. Uh, but each one of those algorithms themselves also need to deal with efficiently scaling out across multiple um, nodes in a compute cluster. Uh, and then within themselves, you know, each step that's running inside a Docker container is also uh, you know, mostly written in Python, um, but is written in a way that uh, it's doing kind of lots of embarrassingly parallel work as well. So uh, we've in invested a lot of time and tooling into to making multi-processing Python um, easy to write so that, um, yeah, a data scientist can, can really optimize uh, the usage of compute infrastructure. Um, but the way that we kind of think about breaking our problems down, we, we need to make sure that uh, each kind of, application execution of, of this kind of fan out step is taking something like half an hour to, to complete. Uh, and that half an hour is, is, um, is really something we found through trial and error, but we are, uh, we've built from the ground up to use spot instances in AWS. Uh, and that means we need to think a lot about um, kind of the ability of our applications to restart halfway through. Uh, we need to think about kind of source of truth of data uh, if you get right to the end of your kind of application and you're, you know, 99% of the way through and then you lose your spot instance, you don't want to have to go back and repay that full 99%. You want to just finish off the last 1%. Um, so we've, we've spent a lot of, of time and effort um, to figure out how to do that in a, in a really robust way. Um, Got it. So to kind of to read back 
uh, or to not read back, but to uh, repeat back some of these ideas back to you to, to see if I'm on track. So you have Python code typically inside of a Docker container. These Docker containers allow us to um, keep specific software libraries, keep, like, keep track of exactly what library versions we're going to need to run our code. And within that Docker container, we can then keep it separate from the rest of a given uh, machine that we're running this code on. So these Docker containers allow us to have this really neat way of having a recipe for exactly what um, software dependencies I'm going to need. And then we can have the Python code uh, running inside of this container. In your case, a lot of that code is to um, run massively parallel uh, GPU computation to be able to process um, imagery, aerial imagery. Um, so that's a Docker container. And then we can use Kubernetes to spin up Docker containers on demand as they're needed, right? Yeah, or, or maybe um, not so much spinning up Docker containers as they're needed, but uh, spinning up compute, uh, compute capability as it's needed. Uh, and then the, the creating of the Docker containers or pods within that Kubernetes cluster, uh, that's where Kubeflow comes in. So Kubeflow is like an orchestration layer that sits on top of uh, Kubernetes. Cool. And then the third K, Kafka, how does that all fit in? Yeah, so, so Kafka is quite an interesting one. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think we're using it in a way that's maybe quite different to, to other people. Uh, so Kafka is like a, a streaming message service. So you, you can think of it uh, very naively as, as like a pub sub. Uh, technology. So you can publish messages to a, to a queue, you can read messages back off the queue. Um, so we effectively use that as our way of communicating through different layers of our pipeline of pipelines. Um, so as much as possible, we want this whole thing to be event driven. Um, mm -hmm. And Kubeflow gives you some elements of that. Uh, so uh, you, can, you can think of uh, just, I, I guess, to go a little bit more detail into, into what Kubeflow is, um, you can think of that as pretty much a, a Python uh, DSL, Python domain-specific language that sits on top of uh, other technologies. Uh, so uh, it was uh, founded based off um, using Argo workflows. Um, so Argo workflows are effectively uh, YAML spec files for running jobs on Kubernetes. Uh, there are now other backends to Kubeflow, but we still use we still use Argo. Um, Kubeflow gives you a bunch of nice things like the ability to do kind of recursive operations. Uh, you can use conditionals, so depending on uh, your your application might output something to the console, and then you can use that as a way of making decisions. Uh, we can do dynamic fanning. Um, so if we think about uh, say you know, a given aerial survey. Um, you know, small ones might be uh, 100 square kilometers and large ones might be 2,000 square kilometers. Uh, we want to break those down into kind of known units of work so that we hit that kind of 30 minute kind of target. Um, so what that might mean is the small survey might have tens of those chunks. Uh, the large surveys might have a thousand of those chunks. Uh, and so that ability to do like a dynamic fan out uh, is, is one of the things that we can do. Uh, using Kubeflow. So Ooh, Kafka really example. is like the the last, I guess, piece where uh, it just lets us tell, uh, you know, like the controlling pipeline when some of the sub pipelines have finished. Uh, again, because we're using spot instances uh, and there's often these kind of weird interactions between spot and Kubernetes where um, if you don't hurt, handle a spot termination really well, Kubernetes can think a job has successfully completed when actually it mm -hmm. hasn't. Um, yeah. So there, there's some really kind of gnarly stuff when you start to run thousand node clusters, um, things that shouldn't really happen if you just read the documentation actually happen in the real world. Um, and so by by using some of the more advanced features of Kubeflow and and by using Kafka as our ability to kind of replay history, um, that's how we we get the the robustness that we really need uh, through all of this. Cool. And the idea of the spot instances there is that the spot instances are cheaper than an instance that you completely reserve for yourself in AWS. But that's why you need to have 
some of this extra um, this extra cleverness built in because because you're getting you're getting this kind of deal on a spot instance in AWS, but it means that if somebody else who's willing to pay more wants that, you can be booted off. And so you're saying that yeah, you described this kind of situation earlier where you could get 99% of the way through a job and then you get booted off the spot instance and you want to pick up where that left off. So I'm starting to piece together why this is so critical. And that makes a lot of sense when you're operating on the scale that you are, it, you know, if you can have the cost and I'm kind of, that's a rough estimate, but I think a spot instance might be about half of the cost of a full dedicated instance in AWS. Uh, when you're running hundreds of GPUs at the same time, just for one set of aerial images across all of the aerial images that you have and all of the different kinds of post-processing layers that you want to compute, uh, get, getting that cost down by half at the risk of being kicked off every once in a while is definitely worth it. So uh, Completely. Cool. Um, and actually, for some of the instance types we use, it's it's closer to 75 or 80% discount compared to on-demand oh, wow. pricing. So it's, it, it, it's the point where, yes, we're paying more in complexity, uh, so we're we're paying the cost in in engineering terms, um, yeah. but the the savings from a compute side are, are, are drastic. Um, but yeah, it's interesting when you know when we start to think about uh, about the scale of what we do. Uh, so we kind of have this adage in my team that um, that everything breaks at scale. It doesn't matter how how good your unit testing suite is. It doesn't matter how uh, you know top notch your your programming standards are. Um, everything is going to break somehow. The real world is a strange place uh, and the edge cases are, are real. Um, we like to joke that you know, if you have a one in a million designed house, uh, we'll see 200 of them just in processing one set of da data from the US. Right, um, right, there are, right. Uh, yeah. Those goddamn non 90 degree angle houses. Exactly. All right. the circle houses out there throwing off your algorithms. Yeah. Architects. Who needs them? <laughs> <laughs> Frank Lloyd Wright, what have you done to my model? Get out of America. Uh, I gotcha. Um, <laughs> so, okay. Um, so that is super cool. I love understanding. Uh, you know, what machine learning operations is in the particular context of your business and why it's so critical at the massive scales that you're working at. So tell us a bit about what the day-to-day -day is like for you and your job. Yeah, so um, I learned pretty early on in, in my career that um, I need to keep technical work as a, as a part of my day job. Um, so I, I guess we'll, we'll talk a, a little bit later on about other things that I've done. Um, but I, I kind of found myself just through working at startups and stuff like that, kind of getting into a lot of strategy type roles um, pretty quickly. Uh, but I, I definitely, uh, <laughs> definitely realized that uh, the need to really get stuck into technical problems uh, is, yeah, and, and doing that on, you know, at least a, a weekly basis uh, is how I stay sane. Um, that idea of kind of getting into a flow state, uh, which I really... Uh, only get when I'm kind of pulling on the threads of a, a difficult technical problem. Mm -hmm. um, that's really critical to me. So, I, so I've tried to set up uh, my job now where I'm spending at least half of my time doing that kind of work. Um, yeah. And we have a fantastic culture in our team where uh, there's a lot of shared ownership over everything. We try to avoid single person projects and stuff like that. Um, so, you know, some days I'll, I'll literally be just pulling the bug off the, the top of the backlog and, and digging oh, into that. Uh, cool. Other days I, I'm sitting down, you know, reading papers on new techniques. We also use a lot of the, the um, open source geospatial stuff. So I've mentioned geospatial a few times already. Um, so, yeah, we, we're pretty big into the, the Python geospatial data science stack. Um, so for those people who haven't really spent much time in this space, uh, there's a library called GeoPandas, uh, which is basically an augmentation of the Pandas library, um, which has a bunch of, of really nice geospatial things that sit on top of it. Um, that's, where... that's cool. I'm going to briefly interrupt you because we had Wes McKinney who made the Pandas library in episode 523, and it blew my mind that pandas has been used like the geopandas that you just described it's been used 
incorporated into half a million other projects in GitHub, which is wild. Um, it's, it doesn't surprise me at all. It's, um, it, it's such a useful uh, way of thinking about data uh, that, to be honest, even just, <laughs> yeah, you, buy, you want to buy a house at home, how, how are you going to figure out what your loans should look like? You're not going to sit down and build an Excel model. You're going to build something out in Python and you're probably going to be using pandas to do it. Like it, it literally percolates every part of my, my life, um, that library. It's, it's so useful. Uh, I, I did listen to, um, to that Wes McKinney episode and, and I have to say I'm pretty humbled to, to also be interviewed by you uh, given that you're having people like that on your show. Yeah, I mean, I'm humbled. That I can't believe that you know I get to interview somebody like that. So, yeah, it's mutual. Um, yeah, super lucky to be here. Um, but yeah, so Geo Pandas. I think you'd actually kind of finished describing how you know. So that's uh, you know, uh, pandas like library in Python for working with geospatial data. And then you were about to talk about something else, and I spoke over you. Yeah. So um, I guess then the other the other part of my job is. Um, you know, a little bit of, of technical strategy and planning out roadmaps and, you know, what we're doing in six months from now, what we're doing in two years from now. Uh, and then really, I guess the, the other kind of arguably the most important part of what I'm doing is, is making sure that my team's happy and productive. So uh, still a relatively small team, nice tight-knit group, um, and uh, probably one of the most high-performing teams I, I've been involved with. Uh, it's, it's really a pleasure to work with these guys. Cool. So what do you look for in people that you're hiring into your team? So yeah, you're the director of AI output systems. It sounds like you're typically always looking for outstanding machine learning engineers um, and also sometimes data scientists. So what do you look for when you bring those people onto your team? Yeah, so I, 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 maybe it's maybe it's an obvious thing to say, maybe it's not, but um, but we really need people who know how to code. Uh, and particularly who know how to code in, in a team environment. Right. Um, and, you know, there are obviously different levels of, of what that means. Um, and, you know, you can augment that with other skill sets, which will, you know, still make you an interesting candidate to us. But um, by and large, we, we need to run prototypes. We do lots of prototype and we do lots of building of new algorithms and stuff like that. But ultimately, whatever we come up with, whatever we design and invent, we need to embed into that massive scalable system that I was just describing. And uh, everything breaks at scale. Uh, and if you're not writing code that can handle that and fail, uh, not even fail gracefully, but fail hard, uh, we don't ever want to recover from unknown situations because uh, mm. that almost always means that the data that's going to come out the other end has some kind of hidden uh, mistake in it. Um, so you need to kind of understand and be able to predict and protect yourself against that kind of stuff. And that really comes from being able to write uh, clean code. Uh, but I guess more than that, we, we've got a really nice kind of culture of, of PRs and pair programming in the team. Um, and, and really it boils down to the idea that uh, individuals might, you know, build out their, their implementation, but once it enters into that PR stage, uh, it then really becomes the team's code rather than that individual person's code. Uh, and so we have this really nice shared responsibility um, approach to that stuff. Um, cool. And uh, just to quickly interrupt, probably most listeners know a PR is a pull request. Um, but so, yeah, yeah, if you want to elaborate on that at all. Yeah. Uh, uh, I, yeah, I guess it's, it's just a way of making sure that uh, more than just you in the team has context of the code that you've written uh, and how that fits into the system. Um, and, you know, it, it's a good way for our senior engineers to help our junior engineers. Um, it's a good way to make sure that there's consistency of, of um, kind of style and approach and, and stuff like that. So, that, you know, there, there's a, a reasonable likelihood that any person in the team can jump into any part of the code in any of our different applications uh, and um, at least be able to figure out what's going on. Cool. Um, but yeah, I, I think that's only, yeah, that's a, that's a necessary but not sufficient kind of criteria. Um, mm -hmm. And I think the, the other stuff is, is a little bit harder to, to really define. Um, but I, I think back to, to the early days of um, the, one of the co-founders from, uh, from one of my early companies uh, had these two statements that, that he used really early on and they've just kind of stuck in my brain. 
Uh, and one is that you can't plow a field, turn it over in your mind. And the other is that uh, a week of hard work can save you an afternoon of careful thought. And those right, so are, are two kind of statements. That paradoxical. Dig into those for us. So start with the first one. You can't plow a field by turning it over in your mind. Yeah. So, so this is really um, getting at the concept that you can spend a lot of time thinking about stuff and planning it out. Um, but until you actually start doing it, it's hard to know whether it, what you've thought about is, is the right stuff. So I guess if you're, if you're doing all of this massive um, kind of planning and you know, down to I'm going to do this on this day and this on this day, type approach, the likelihood of that plan actually being how you build and deliver a thing, uh, particularly in unknown environments where there's a bit of R&D involved, uh, it, it basically just doesn't happen. You, you, right, you can't right. possibly know everything at the start of the project and it's only going to be at the point at which you, you start doing stuff that you really start to, I guess, figure out uh, some of the things that you don't know at the start. Yeah, so that's, yeah. that, that's that idea that... Um, yeah, just by thinking about stuff, you can't actually make uh, a, a physical thing in the world. You can't change a physical thing in the world just by just by thinking about it. Not yet. Totally. Anyway. Maybe yeah. maybe Neuralink will change that. But uh. <laughs> um, yeah, so maybe that one wasn't as paradoxical as I thought. But the second one, okay, that one seems paradoxical. A week of hard work can save you an afternoon of careful thought. Yeah. Right. So so this is um, this is the other end of the spectrum, right? If you if you don't spend your time thinking up front you can just dive straight in and you can spend a week doing all of this you know what you think is really uh, good hard work right but you get to the end of that week and you realize you've built the wrong thing and if you had have thought about it a little bit more carefully at the start um then you wouldn't have ended up in that situation so they're right. they're, they're literally opposite ends of the spectrum um and uh, i think uh when you work in a, an unknown environment like uh, R&D and algorithmic development, um, those two things are always going to be uh, kind of in balance with each other. Um, and, uh, you know, there, there's, not a, um, there's not a right or a wrong uh, place to stand on that continuum. Um, and some people in my team will be, will be much more interested in in effectively building prototypes and that's their way of thinking and designing. Other people uh, might be much more comfortable sitting down with a pen and paper. Um, but I think one of the really clear or one of the really important skills is to know that those two things exist, that it is a continuum and there are trade-offs of being at either end um, and figuring yeah, out yeah. how to frame your projects in, in that kind of way, um, I think is, is one of the really, um, yeah, one of the really hard skills to judge during interviews. Uh, but one of the most valuable skills that you can have uh, once you actually start work. Yeah, that's a super interesting point. I think you, once somebody's working with you over the course of a few weeks or certainly a few months, you can start to get the sense that this person is really good at striking that balance. Um, and the way that I think you can kind of tell that that's happening. So even in this remote working world that, I'm in now still at least, um, I can tell with people on my team who are getting more done in a given day or a given week than I think is possible. <laughs> There's somehow, they're finding this balance just right where they're like, you know, spending a little bit of time, making sure that, that they're not likely to be totally wasting an afternoon or morning, uh, but, you know, spending a little bit of time planning about what's the right way to do this, maybe talking to somebody that might have a bit more expertise on part of what you're working on. Um, and then, yeah, so having a, a hypothesis as to how the field can be plowed, um, and then just getting going on it, discovering inevitably that, okay, you can't plow it this way, but, um, I know it, it, it leads you in, in the right direction and, and things get done really quickly. And so those people that can strike that balance, I mean, I just love working with them. They're, um, a manager's dream. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. And I think one of the, um, one of the things that, or maybe one of the characteristics that sits in people who do that balance really well, uh, is they tend to be solution oriented rather than problem oriented. Uh, so yeah. rather than kind of coming to 
say, the daily stand-up with a list of things that are wrong. It's, you know, coming to the daily stand-up with a, here's my challenge and here's my proposal for different solutions. Help me choose the right one. Well said. Exactly right. Okay, cool. So we got onto this because we were because we were exploring what you look for in the people you hire, and you've given a really beautiful answer. Um, thank you for that uh, thoughtful work, Brett. And so that the <laughs> the listener is aware, uh, in true Brett Tully form. Uh, so usually before these episodes, I have to do a lot of research and kind of come up with a structure for the episode. I'm <laughs> we're going over a document that Brett prepared before the episode that is kind of he'd done all my homework for me. And so he's just got these amazing answers to a lot of the big questions, a lot of the best questions that I could have possibly asked. And we're just kind of going through that. So um, thank you. And uh, yeah, yeah, wonderful, wonderful guest. Uh, top marks. <laughs> um, OK, so we've talked about what you're doing today at NearMap, but we haven't even uh, gotten into the incredible things that you've done in the past and that have led you to these vast machine learning operations, um, you know, this vast machine learning operations expertise at a, at a top uh, cutting edge machine learning company. So um, we can start with, you know, when I first knew you, you were doing a PhD in biomedical engineering at Oxford and you were working on a, a health problem um, called hydrocephalus, which so I did, you know, my PhD is in neuroscience. So I kind of, I'm aware of what hydrocephalus is. It's this condition where people have too much water in their brain. Well, it's not water, it's cerebrospinal fluid, um, which is a liquid in your uh, central nervous system, uh, in, your, in your spine and in your brain. Uh, but in people with hydrocephalus, they produce too much of it. And so um, this leads to structural uh, abnormalities in the skull, as well as uh, potentially developmental disorders uh, mentally, because the, the brain is being squished by uh, the cerebrospinal fluid. So, um, so you're working on this medical problem, hydrocephalus, but uh, you're doing it from a computational perspective. You're working with data um, to model this condition and even more interestingly, perhaps, you're simulating data so you, as opposed to collecting it. So um, did I get that right? Did I remember everything correctly? And, and tell yeah, us a bit more about it if I did. Pretty good memory for 15 years. Um, yeah, so I guess in many ways, I'm kind of like an accidental ML engineer. Um, I, I came to these problems uh, really as a, a numerical scientist um, and uh, you know, my undergrad was was mechanical eng and applied maths, um, and I got really into fluid dynamics um, just through my courses. Uh, and I ended up uh, kind of taking all of that into this biomedical program. Um, and yeah, you're right. So, so hydrocephalus is is basically um, we produce cerebral spinal fluid kind of really at the center of our brain. So, uh, as we as we develop kind of as an embryo, our brain starts off flat. And, and as we develop, it folds over. Uh, and we have these, uh, these ventricles that sit in the middle of the brain. Um, and they have a bunch of these kind of small cells uh, which effectively extract fluid out of the blood uh, and that circulates through the, um, through the brain. Uh, and hydrocephalus is when uh, some part of that system uh, gets disrupted. And you can see it uh, a lot in, in children. Uh, so uh, most of that is congenital, as in exists at birth, uh, and can often be associated with other kind of um, uh, uh, syndromes like Down syndrome, and, and uh, if I'm re remembering correctly, um, and and that that one is is perhaps a little bit more intuitive to understand because there are developmental uh, problems that have already existed. Uh, or, or have already happened in, in the brain. And so the fact that this fluid system uh, has been disrupted uh, is maybe not, um, not that confusing. Uh, the specific uh, condition I was looking at is, is called normal pressure hydrocephalus. Uh, and this is actually something that happens in old age. Uh, and the symptoms look very much the same as, as the symptoms of, um, of dementia. 
So it's the, the triad of, um, of a bad gait, uh, incontinence and mental decline. Uh, but the big difference is, um, at the moment anyway, we, we don't really have ways of, uh, of reversing things like dementia, uh, but we do have ways of, of reversing uh, normal pressure hydrocephalus. And so if you can figure out a way to distinguish between uh, which one of those conditions a patient has, um, then the outlook can be really good if you fall into that uh, hydrocephalus category. Oh, wow. Um, so, yeah, well, what we were looking at is... Uh, I guess maybe these days we, we think about it as creating data and then running data analysis. In, in those days, uh, it's just simulation. So uh, really from, from first principles, how do we use maths? How do we use partial differential equations to, uh, to model how fluid should flow through the brain? Um, and so uh, I started working uh, on this idea that... Uh, a set of or a system of, of mathematical equations that get used a lot in the oil and gas industry uh, could be useful for, for studying how fluid moves around uh, and interacts with tissue in, in the brain. Um, so they're called poroelastic models. So porous, you know, thinking of things like a sponge and elastic being, you know, how, uh, how materials respond to, to stress or to pressure. Um, and... Uh, there's a, a system of equations which kind of relates all of that together and, and you can, yeah, it probably makes sense to you that uh, if you've got like a, say, a sponge that you're doing the washing up with, uh, as you squeeze that sponge, the por the porosity of it would change and the ability for water to flow through it would change and stuff like that. So it's the same kind right. of idea uh, that we were looking at. Um, but the the concept of of kind of data and generalization and stuff like that is is a really um it's a really hard one when you start to look at uh things like this where it's exceptionally difficult to do experimentation um for all of the good reasons around medical ethics um you can't just invoke hydrocephalus in a bunch of patients and then right. do some kind of testing to see whether your model works right um, and in some senses, that's the real power of modeling in these types of diseases is that we can, we can try a bunch of different things to explore what might be the cause of this, this disease. Um, what we found, uh, and, and one of the real drivers for the research, was that uh, the, the typical way of, of treating this condition is basically to put a, um, a, a shunt into the skull, so literally drill a hole in the skull create a, a valve and when the pressure gets too high or when the fluid uh, builds up too much, you just drain a bunch of fluid out. Wow. Um, and there's, there had been at the time um, several decades of research increasing the sophistication of these shunts. Um, while in parts of Africa there was a bunch of literature showing that uh, they were effectively using first-generation models uh, and there was almost no difference at all in the clinical outcomes. So decades of research into shunt technology wasn't driving improved clinical outcome. Ah. And we kind of hypothesized that that was because uh, the underlying physics that was driving those designs wasn't well understood. So it wasn't actually, um, it wasn't a problem of uh, the absorption uh, of the fluid been the issue or it wasn't the way that uh, the way that people currently thought the the fluid was being reabsorbed into the bloodstream uh, which was basically through the the venous sinus which runs down the center of your skull um, so we came up with this this hypothesis that it was actually in uh, the interstitial fluid uh, in the brain tissue itself had mm -hmm. some mechanism of uh, of just of changing the way that that fluid moved around in the brain um, and so we, you know, we modelled it, and it was all uh, very theoretical and very abstract. Um, and in some ways, that's what I wanted out of my PhD. I wanted to go theoretical because I knew that I was going to spend the rest of my career doing applied stuff. Um, oh. But I also got to the end of it. I was a bit kind of um, put out by the fact that I would never know whether what I was predicting was actually real. Um, but what was cool is that maybe three or four years after I finished finished my PhD, there was a, a bunch of research that came out completely independent of us, had had no relationship at all to what we were doing, 
Um, but they reported this new experimentally discovered uh, fluid transfer system in the brain called the lymphatic drainage, drainage system. Um, and everything they described in their experimental studies actually fit really neatly with what we come up with in our modeling approach. Um, oh, cool. So even though it's completely independent and, and uh, you know, no one's taken our models and, and tried to apply it directly to those experiments, um, the concept of it certainly holds true. And, um, yeah, that, that was quite fun to see because uh, in some ways, as you know, you know, the you write your PhD, you get your Viber done, and then you realise that maybe five people in the world are ever going to have read it, and, <laughs> and that's the sum total of your three and a half years of work. Um, so Did you know that you can actually go, so you can go to, I can't remember the site now, but there is, um, so like I link to you on my website somewhere like johncrone.com slash publications or something. I have a link to my dissertation in the Oxford University Library. And so you can actually go and see how many people have downloaded yours and read it. And it might be, you might be surprised. It might be quite a bit more than five. Um, yeah, I, I might look that up and, and either advertise it or not, depending on, <laughs> on how big the number is. <laughs> um, but yeah, so that's super cool. And so I love the idea. I never heard you say it then, or I don't remember you saying it then. And I've never heard anybody uh, say this to me before, but that idea of knowing that you want to have an applied career, you want to be doing something that's having an impact on the world. So to take time in your life and be getting really deep onto a more pure mathematical problem. Although this isn't pure math, it's still applied <laughs> to a, a real problem. Um, <laughs> you're not like coming up with the shape of different kinds of donuts, yeah. uh, <laughs> which is that, which even though that maybe didn't sound like pure math is pure math. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's a really interesting take on like why you would study something like that. And very cool to find out after the fact that you know, some of your simulations might have been, um, you know, might have been accurate based on, you know, new information from real experimental studies. But um, all of that experience with your data simulation ended up coming in very handy for your next work, which was working on da -da -da -da, on nuclear fusion. And so the approach that the company that you were working at, First Light Fusion, takes is mind-blowing to me. And I've actually, in recent years, I have read about the first light fusion approach in The Economist. I just, you know, I read The Economist pretty much every week. And uh, they were talking about fusion power, um, which really quickly for audience members who aren't aware. So right now, all of the nuclear power plants that we have in the world um, that are actually, you know, generating energy for, for us, um, they use fission. So this involves fission means splitting. So you have very heavy atoms, very large atoms. Um, I can't remember the exact number and you might know this, uh, you might yeah, know this better than me, but something, there's a particular atomic weight that kind of atoms are most stable at. And it's kind of this like middle weight. And so things that are really heavy, really, really heavy atoms, they wanna split to get closer to that moderate weight. Um, uh, but also, Atoms that are very small want to fuse to get to that uh, moderate weight. So all of our existing nuclear systems are based on this idea of fission, of heavy molecules uh, splitting and becoming uh, two lighter atoms. And it's in that splitting that an absolutely enormous amount of energy is released following that famous um, Einstein equation, E equals MC squared. So just a tiny, tiny, tiny little bit of mass change as a result of this fission. Uh, results in the amount of energy that's mass times the speed of light squared, which is all of a sudden this enormous amount of energy. So that's fission. Fusion um, is something that we don't have today. So, I mean, well, you could probably speak about this in more detail. We have some experiments <laughs> that have been run involving fusion energy that um, I think we've like, maybe just in the last few years, if I remember correctly, we've had the first experiments that produced slightly more energy 
then was required to make the experiment run properly. Because you have to have, with some approaches, you have to have these like plasmas that are floating in anti, like you have to make them float a liquid hot plasma and the reaction takes place inside of it. And I don't know, you, you know more, more detail than me, surely. But um, this company, but, but so the idea here with fusion power is that you could have, um, you know, even though, so, so fission gets a, gets a bad press because of, you know, slight disasters like Chernobyl and Fukushima. Uh, fission gets this really bad rap of being really dangerous. Although in most cases it is, uh, it is actually quite safe. It's definitely safer, um, uh, than, than coal energy in terms of, uh, you know, the impact that it has on, on people's lungs and people's health in large areas. But so fission has this kind of bad rap, even though I'm, I'm a pretty big fan. Um, and so fusion is seen as this, um, is potentially this incredible energy source in the future because it could involve things like hydrogen and oxygen, which we can get anywhere, uh, fusing together to make water as a byproduct instead of some nuclear waste. Um, so anyway, tremendous potential in nuclear fusion. I've been speaking way too long as the host of the program. So I'll, let me turn it over to you and tell us about the first light approach to fusion and also correct everything that I got wrong. <laughs> no, that's a, that's a pretty good intro. Um, look, I, I think it's interesting to, to kind of go back to, to where it started um, because how I ended up working there is, is pretty hard to explain without doing that. Um, and uh, first light, so it was originally called Oxyntix, uh, for those who really want to go into the, the history of the company. Um, it, was, it was spun out of the lab where I did my PhD. Uh, so my supervisor was this, this crazy, cool, incredible researcher who um, just had his fingers in so many different pies. So we were, we were based in the Institute of Biomedical Engineering, and the majority of our group was working on uh, fluidics problems related to to biology. Um, like the hydrocephalus. Like hydrocephalus. Others yeah. were working on uh, things like cerebral aneurysms. Um, there were agent-based models of, of different things like uh, modeling impact of, of chemical molecules on blood. And so, so all simulation, all numerical science, largely driven uh, by biological problems. Um, but Yanis had this kind of side project where he was looking at fusion. Um, so it, it started uh, with uh, one of our lab mates, so, so Nick Hawker, uh, he was the year behind me. It started with his master's project and, and then kind of moved into to what became his PhD and, and therefore the, the, the basis of the IP for the company. Um, but it was this really kind of new, really, really niche numerical modeling uh, approach. So, um, treating uh, fluids uh, with completely separate or very distinct properties. So think of like the interface between water and gas. Um, modeling that numerically is an exceptionally difficult problem um, because the, the way that the, the numerics would work out is you end up with these really stiff kind of sets of equations uh, which become numerically unstable. So anyway, there was this really cool uh, super niche numerical modeling tool uh, that was built for solving that problem. Uh, and Giannis, uh, through a, a kind of weird set of happenstance, uh, had ended up figuring out or, or having this idea of, of using that modeling approach to study what happens when you compress uh, bubbles of fluid with some kind of uh, high pressure wave in, in some kind of working liquid. Um, and it, it wasn't the driver at the time, but um, you know, if, if you kind of do research in this area, you can you can see that it's actually something that happens uh, in nature. So there's this um, this shrimp called the mantis shrimp, oh, uh, yeah. which literally snaps its claws together so quickly uh, that it creates a shock wave, uh, and that's what kills its prey. And 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 there we go. That's how it has its dinner. There's a famous like internet cartoon by the oatmeal of how those mantis shrimp work. I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll find that and put it in the show notes. Yeah, it's, um, it, it's really cool stuff. And some of the, like this um, high-speed video on, on YouTube and stuff like that, it's, it's pretty cool stuff. Um, 
yeah, so anyway, Nick, Nick and, and Giannis are, are using this uh, really complex, really interesting modeling approach to study that phenomena. Uh, and they realize um, that if you do it in a particular way, uh, the conditions inside that uh, gas bubble get really hot, they get really dense. Um, and maybe if you add enough energy into the system, then you can start to get close to, um, to fusion conditions. Um, and so they, they filed a bunch of patents um, and uh, I guess they were, they were at this, um, this kind of uh, fork in the road where you could either say, yeah, this is very early, uh, really we should be researching this in an academic environment, I'm going to apply for some grant funding. Or you can say, if this technology works, the potential for it is just so massive that there's got to be some commercial interest around, I'm going to go raise some money. Uh, I'm going to raise it from people with patient capital because I know it's going to be a long time before there's an ROI, return on investment. Um, so anyway, they took the second approach. Uh, they founded <laughs> a company called Oxintix and I jumped on board as the first employee. Whoa. So... Let's uh, back up one second here, just so I, before we get into exactly what you were doing as the first employee at First Light, let me uh, kind of repeat back for the audience what the company does. So, um, so from initially simulations of how different uh, fluids could interact or different kinds of substances could interact through this kind of, through this simulation research that was initially based in a biomedical engineering department. Uh, these guys, Ioannis and Dave, had this idea to um, to have to have bubbles collapse, <laughs> uh, and making these bubbles collapse in a certain way um, creates so much uh, so much temperature, so much pressure, both um, kind of like. Uh, these 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 mantises um, under sea, uh, which because so they use that kind of uh, the super cavitation um, of these bubbles. They use it to uh, like stun prey or kill prey, and so that same kind of effect somehow um, causes could potentially cause fusion reactions to happen. Is that did I get part of that right? Any of it? <laughs> yeah, I mean certainly that's that's how the company was founded, and obviously um, you know. What is it now? Ten years has passed. Um, so, as you would expect, the sophistication has moved on a little bit from uh, from those early days. But yeah, by and large, that that was um, that was kind of where we started. Um, and so, yeah, I kind of jumped in as the first employee. I was I was running, uh, basically taking over some of the modeling work. Uh, Nick was still there and, and finishing off his PhD. Um, but really what the, the company was founded around was this idea that we had to gather some experimental data. Uh, and so we, we uh, hired uh, Phil, Phil Anderson, uh, who you will remember from, from those days, and, um, and uh, another one, uh, Matt Bettany, was, was a student working with us at the time. So it was really just the four of us sitting uh, in this, this room in Oxford, uh, you know, trying to work on fusion uh, and trying to build out an experiment that could validate these numerical models. Um, and it was just a hell of a lot of fun. There was, uh, there was just so much uh, energy and excitement uh, in what we were doing, uh, but also uh, some level of risk. It's, it's the kind of thing I think you, you do when you're, you're 20 something and maybe less so when you're 40 or, or 50 something. Um, and yeah, I can remember you know some of the the most fun I've had um, probably in my career actually is uh, just towards the end of the first year of of that company being founded, we were we getting pretty close to the end of our runway, and uh, our experiments just weren't working. And so the four of us basically locked ourselves in a room with a bunch of whiteboards, and and redesigned the entire thing from the ground up. And um, and Phil went away and and built it uh, and. Got the experiment running and and literally the first kind of series of experiments we gathered all of the data we needed to hit our milestones unlock the next round of cash and and i guess everything else is history at that point um but just that idea that um young ambitious excited people can can get together and and, and genuinely change meaningful things is is such a an exciting yeah thing. and it, it's super cool i mean so 
you know, at that time that you were doing that, that you were crammed in that room, running out of runway and finding a way to make this work. Um, now, uh, seven, eight years later, First Light Fusion has raised $62 million, um, including from some major, uh, you know, well-known venture capital firms. So, yeah. So still, you know, we, we don't know when. Well, actually, so instead of me saying we don't know when, Brett Tully, when do you think, based on your <laughs> incredible expertise as a fusion expert, how long do you think it is before we have well, okay, you know, I guess, I, I guess I could ask it like commercial, you know, commercial fusion, you know, it, it seems like that's likely in our lifespans from one approach or another, whether it's super cavitation um, or some other approach. I know that there are at least kind of three major um, efforts and I, I, you know, I, I can't off the top of my head spin on what they are, but three completely different kinds of approaches, some involving lasers or lava or both uh, and, and that, and also this, um, super cavitation approach that First Life Fusion has. Um, yeah, so it seems like in our lifetime, we could have fusion power, which would be incredible because it's this, it's, it could be this abundant power source. It's safe. The output is water. And, uh, you know, having uh, abundant energy could solve so many problems that we face today. It could accelerate, um, you know, the development of third world countries, even the, accelerate the development of first world countries. Um, and... Uh, you know, without the need for burning fossil fuels. In fact, we could even be powering systems for carbon capture and reducing the amount of carbon uh, in the atmosphere. So um, please tell us it's possible and, uh, and tell us when. <laughs> uh, so I, I'm going to completely dodge the when question, uh, <laughs> not least of which because I'm no longer actively working on it. No, um, look, uh, the, the way I think about these, these kind of problems is... Um, and and this is true for for things like AI and healthcare. It's it's true for any of the really big grand cha challenges of engineering. Um, fast forward a hundred years, and if you can see a future where fusion is a thing in in a hundred years time, and uh, and I can, um, that tells me that it's going to happen at some point. Mm -hmm. Now the question is, when between now and a hundred years from now, does does that happen? Um, and you know, there's always that that saying of, you know, being early is just as bad as being wrong. Um, but I think for, for these types of things, particularly from a technologist point of view, is that uh, that's just abundantly not true. Um, the point at which that transition happens, it will always be standing on the shoulders of what came before. Um, and so the fact that we are now entering into this phase where uh, there's a really significant amount of private investment going into fusion, uh, it, it makes me very confident that the problem will be solved. Uh, so there are mainstream approaches that are coming out of uh, national laboratories. Um, so you have the National Ignition Facility in the US, right. you have ITER in the south of France. Right. Uh, those are, are the two alternative approaches to fusion uh, that are kind of coming out of the mainstream, uh, incredibly well-funded uh, national lab type approaches, or in the case of ITER, international lab. Um, but you're starting to see this this kind of plethora of, of startup companies um, uh, kind of come into existence and and really receive some some fairly significant amounts of funding. Um, you know, there are I think all of the tech billionaires now have their hands in at least some element of of fusion research, um, and it just seems inevitable uh, and. The reason why I think it seems inevitable, so there's obviously this race to net zero at 2050. Um, and net, that's net zero, uh, carbon emissions. Carbon emissions. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that, that's critically important, obviously, for, for everything we know about climate change to, to really hit that goal. Um, but in my mind, that's, that's kind of, uh, it's kind of like the, the, I don't want to say status quo because that's going to get misquoted, but uh, that is really what we need to do to, to maintain society functioning the way that we currently think of it as functioning. Um, but when you start to think about something like fusion power, so uh, because it's based on um, fuel that is so abundantly available, uh, as you know, if you take the current energy usage of the planet, there's something like 9 billion years worth of deuterium sitting in the world's oceans. Um, 
so as a as a long term sustainable fuel source, uh, there's no reason to think that uh, that we would ever run out. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, in, in my mind, that doesn't just become a technology that helps us sustain our current approach to sort of economic activity and and kind of energy usage. Um, that becomes a technology that is a step change in the way that humanity thinks about the availability of effectively on tap energy. And what oh. we can do with that is, is I think uh, you'll have a bunch of futurists who can, who can kind of think it along those lines uh, and some of it will be true and some of it will be so far off the mark. But um, even if we just think about something as simple as the availability of water, um, clean water is is such a fundamental need of of humankind uh, and yet the availability of that uh, particularly in resource poor uh, environments is is really challenging um, but ultimately turning seawater into drinkable water potable water is just a question of energy um, and so if you right. start to solve the energy challenge um, the ability to to do all sorts of new and and kind of crazy things, um, I think I think is is really exciting. So, uh, I think the question of is it going to happen uh, is is yes, I think it is going to happen. Um, I'm sure there'll be people who disagree, but in in my view, uh, there is now enough momentum and enough yeah. interest that uh, there are some of the smartest people I've ever met are, are working on that problem. Um, the question of when that happens uh, and which approach will be the approach that is successful, and I don't think it's a winner takes all thing. Uh, so even if you know one company beats some other company to the to the first kind of working reactor, um, I don't think that's the end of the game. Uh, I think that's really just the start. So I think there's there's a huge commercial opportunity. Obviously, uh, when that's going to happen. Uh, I, I, I'm not the right person to ask. There, I'm too far out of the game now. Nice. Well, yeah. I mean, I agree with you. It seems like these kinds of facilities, like ITER and the National Ignition Facility, they are getting so close to having uh, reliable experiments that produce more energy than it costs to uh, to have the reaction happen. So, uh, so we haven't quite got to that stage yet. We haven't. Uh, no, I thought it was no. So, yeah. so ITER, um, ITER is based on magnetic fusion, uh, and it hasn't been switched on yet. So, it's still under construction. Uh, will be, I think, until mid this decade. Um, but it's based on uh, a previous experiment just in down the road from us in Oxford. In uh, so the the um, joint European Taurus, uh, and I think they I, I don't quote me on the numbers, but they got to something like. 0.8 energy out compared to energy in something like that. Right. right, right. Um, the the national ignition facility though has made some really big strides forward in the last um, probably five years. Uh, it was just a couple of months ago where they announced um, some experiments where they started to get. Uh, I think they got more energy out than the energy that was put into the target, um, which is different to the amount of energy that it took to kind of get the lasers started up and stuff like that. So they have, right, right, right. Uh, because they're using lasers, lasers are a very inefficient way of, of delivering energy into the target. So there's, there's quite a lot of um, wastage before you even get to that point. Right. Um, but so maybe that's the, that's the thing yeah, that it, I was reading about that. It's like, okay, we're getting more energy out at like when the experiment's actually running or something, but it's, yeah, that doesn't include yeah. Yeah, energy of getting it going. It, it shouldn't be underestimated that that is a that's a, a massive breakthrough, and uh, even that some people didn't think was going to be possible. So uh, it certainly caused a lot of excitement uh, in the field. Cool. So tell us a bit about the tools that you used in both of those jobs, in both the uh, hydrocephalus modeling. I mean, a job, PhD, whatever. It's kind of like a job. Um, in those two roles. Uh, so modeling hydrocephalus during your PhD as the head of simulation of first light fusion, what kinds of tools do you use to simulate data? Yeah, so the um, uh, so if we start with the PhD, uh, that was um, based around a commercial fluid dynamics platform. Um, and 
what I was doing was kind of writing uh, like plugins that would sit in the back end of that. So as it would solve its system of equations, I could basically augment that with additional um, terms. Uh, and for my sins, that was Fortran. Uh, so oh, I was no writing. Kidding. Yeah. It, what, what was the commercial tool called? Uh, I can't think of the name oh, off the yeah. top of my head. It's, oh, it's yeah. been so Maybe. long. If, uh, yeah, if, if you remember, then I, I can check it show in. notes later. Yeah. 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 Um, uh, but then you have to use Fortran to interact with that commercial application. Yeah. And, and <clears throat> yeah, that I guess is, yeah, Fortran is still very much a language of, uh, numerical science. Um, and there are still a lot of people actively working on, on that. Uh, that Fortran was not the fun Fortran, if that is even a, uh, thing that can exist. Uh, that's um, what the F stands for, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, from what I understand, modern Fortran is is much nicer to work with. Um, what I was doing was not. Um, so anyway, that that that's kind of where where that was so that was kind of working. I had uh, prototypes written in Python, um, and uh, that's kind of how I did my fast iteration. And then uh, when I got things that I thought were sensible, they got moved into into the Fortran plugin for that um, commercial software. And what that meant I could do is uh, I actually had uh, CT scans of, of patients. Uh, and so I could um, effectively uh, what we would call generate a mesh. Uh, so take a 3D, uh, I guess, build a 3D representation of, of the fluid channels in that brain. Uh, and then that's what I would use as part of my simulation. So that would go into the, the fluid solver uh, and you could you could kind of simulate the the movement of CSF uh, with, cool. with these kind of adjusted terms. Um, first light was was different, so uh, it was almost as far away from commercial as you could uh, imagine from the from the software point of view. So I mentioned that um, that the modeling approach was was very niche, uh, and so uh, when I started, uh, Nick had been using uh, this this piece of software called Frontier. That have been developed by Stony Brook University. Uh, it's about five hundred thousand lines of C. Uh, that project started in about nineteen seventy, uh, oh, wow. and was basically object oriented C, and written before C plus plus even existed. Right. Uh, it was full of function pointers. It, uh, I think, when it was first designed and built, was probably. Uh, extremely cutting edge from a software engineering point of view but in the 40 years since uh it had been modified and hacked together by a bunch of phd students uh and that beautiful design didn't really <laughs> exist anymore uh yeah. so so my job when i first started was was to extend it and add new features and, and stuff like that it was an absolute nightmare it was slow it was cumbersome uh we had to design the things that we were simulating we had to build in c so you know if you wanted to draw a circle you had to literally write C code to draw a circle. Um, and yeah, that was just, a, a, it was slow and cumbersome and, and not a good use of the very small amount of money that we'd raised. <laughs> um, so uh, we actually got together and we decided um, that we would propose a, a rewrite. rewrite uh, and um, rewriting 500,000 lines of C uh, that have been written over 40 years uh, and yeah. a, a couple of 20-somethings think that they can do that off a, a small amount of venture funding. Um, but in the end, we we, we got the go-ahead. Uh, so we raised a little bit more money from the investors to, to fund that. Uh, and it took, uh, with some external consultants helping, uh, about nine months uh, to fully wow. replicate the functionality. Um, and what was great about it, uh, it a few different things that we we did, which turned out to be really really valuable. First of all, um, this idea of of data science software being a two language problem, uh, so putting your really high performance stuff into a high performance language, uh, but making sure the user interface is Python, so scripting user user interface. So you know people are writing code, uh, but they're writing Python. They're not writing C or C plus plus or whatever else. Um, and then that way you're sort of balancing the needs of high performance with the needs of of you know, getting experimental physicists to run simulations of their experiment. Yeah, yeah. Um, you don't want them to be to be worrying about compiled languages. Yeah, um, it's similar to today when you do a lot of linear algebra operations in Python in the back end. It is running in 
older languages like Fortran. Um, very exactly. Uh, you know, in fact, you could you could probably say that of, of pretty much everything in the data stack is is built with these high performance compiled binaries uh, with a effectively a, a nice scripting language sitting on top as the user interface. Mm. Um, but the other the other cool thing that we did was uh, so I, I mentioned before that we were modeling the interface between different fluid types, so like water and air or whatever the case may be, um, and we were doing that using. Uh, what we called a Lagrangian grid. So basically it was a two grid solution. The, the background mesh, which is common in, in kind of fluid solving things is just like squares and uh, material flows in and out of those squares uh, and that's fixed. Uh, so we'd call that an Eulerian grid. The Lagrangian grid that sits on top basically tracks the interface between those materials. Uh, and so that effectively becomes a computational geometry problem. Um, and so when we designed uh, this code, we split those two things out as very unique concepts. Uh, and that effectively allowed us to test the Lagrangian part of the software completely independently of any physics. Um, and that was where we had found most of our problems with that old C library. Mm -hmm. So by splitting that out, having a really clear testing strategy, uh, we could deal with the majority of problems we knew were going to exist completely independently of worrying about plasma physics, which we knew was going to be some other very substantially difficult challenge. Mm -hmm. um, but by separating those two concepts out in, in the software uh, meant we could actually move a lot faster. Cool. Really good explanation uh, at a low level of what you were doing there. Um, so then from that simulation work, that you were doing in the PhD uh, and then at the Fusion Company at First Light Fusion, uh, you then moved to Australia. You moved uh, back to your home country, um, not your hometown because you're from Brisbane, but you moved back to Sydney um, and you worked on human cancer. So you worked on a project. Um, I guess it, it was it was kind of academic, right? There was a lot of focus on publishing papers. Um, but it was part of a, a medical research institute, the Sydney Children's Medical Research Institute. And so you're working on the ProCan project, um, which was um, studying the proteome of human cancer. So um, we, in a kind of systems biology perspective, all of your genetic information, all of your DNA, uh, we call that our genome. Uh, so all the genetic information is a genome. Um, there is an uh, analogous kind of idea with all of the proteins in your body, we could catalog this as the proteome, um, which I imagine is a much tougher task because DNA very nicely is this information store. It's linear. Uh, and so you can kind of, you need to, it was a huge undertaking to sequence the first human genome, but now it's relatively trivial. Uh, and cause you just had to uh, in, devise a system that could reliably read this long string of letters. Um, it's not as simple as letters, but a uh, molecular structure that we encode as letters. But, it, you know, it's, it's just repeats of these of four possible letters. Unlike uh, genetic information, which um, is all conveniently packaged um, onto DNA, uh, proteins are floating all over the body. Um, and, uh, yeah, so I imagine there's all kinds of complexity with, um, with, with studying a proteome. But we can nevertheless today, we can examine, okay, what is a quote unquote healthy proteome like? And then how is it different, say, under cancer conditions? Um, and so the idea being that if you can identify uh, new differences, then we can maybe identify new causes of the cancer or new solutions to particular types of cancer. Um, I hope I'm presenting that uh, somewhat correctly. And again, you can correct me on what I'm wrong about. But um, so at uh, Sydney Children's Medical Research Institute working on this proteome of human cancer project. You were a, uh, 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 eventually uh, there, you were a group leader of software engineering. So um, yeah, so I guess that's another really kind of interesting application of data science. Um, so um, yeah, so I don't know what you want to jump into there, but uh, you know, describing the problem, talking about the, the software tools that you were using to analyze the data that you had would be uh, very interesting. Yeah, so um, 
I guess first off, you know, you mentioned the the genome and the and the proteome, and and the way that uh, we used to conceptualize those in that program is um, the the genome might understand might help us understand the cause of cancer. Uh, so you know, it might be something that's congenital in in kids, like some some genetic uh, defect. Uh, it might be something that's environmental, like skin cancer, where uh, UV rays have have caused mutations in your genome. Um, what the proteome helps us understand is is how to treat the cancer. That's the that's the idea, um, and the reason we say that is the majority of uh, cancer treatments operate operate at the protein level, um, and so there's a a hypothesis that's that's getting tested in that program of work is that if you can collect the the proteome of tens of thousands of of cancers across all different cancer types. Uh, it can then become a data science problem to see uh, what are the commonalities, what are the proteins that are stable in the population so they can be ruled out. Um, you might be able to start doing things like, uh, you know, there's one cohort of people with one particular cancer type who respond really well to a particular drug. Uh, but then it turns out that there's another cohort of people who, uh, from a proteomic point of view, look very similar to that group, uh, but a completely different cancer. Uh, and maybe that treatment that worked for column A uh, might also be applicable to column B. So that kind of um, right. you know transfer of of treatments across different cancer types. Yeah. Um, the other thing that uh, so obviously being a, a children's medical research institute, uh, one thing that was was of fundamental interest to to the program is what can we learn about childhood cancer uh, by studying lots of adult cancer. Uh, and the reason for that is uh, childhood cancer is is very rare, thankfully. Uh, but when it does happen, it, it's normally quite tragic. Mm. Um, and gathering the data for uh, for childhood cancer um, would be very difficult to to gather enough samples uh, to be able to turn that into a data science problem. Uh, but hopefully, we can learn things about the protein structures in in cancer generally. Uh, and use that uh, to to start guiding some of the treatments in in childhood cancer. Um, it's going to take time to be able to do that. You need to build up this database of of knowledge of of how protein uh, interactions and and protein structures uh, work. Um, but if it can happen, then then that would be a a, a kind of major breakthrough in, in the way that we deal with uh, some really sad situations. So yeah, um. Basically, uh, my role there is is or was uh, not that dissimilar to what I do currently. Uh, it's just that hmm. the the underlying algorithms were completely different. So right. we effectively had uh, large pipelines of algorithmic work. Where uh, so I guess just taking half a step back, how do we actually get a proteome? Uh, so the the experimental technique that was being used in Procan was. Uh, this concept known as data independent acquisition, mass spectrometry. Uh, so basically, you would take a, a sample of the cancer, uh, and you would run that through some some lab process, which would basically break that tissue down into um, into peptides. So uh, using enzymes, you know, synthetic versions of the enzymes in your gut and, and stuff like that, we can effectively unfold the 3D structure of the protein and snip it up into little pieces. And then you can inject that into a mass spectrometer. And uh, for those who don't know, that's basically a, a, a large electromagnetic system, uh, which just uses Maxwell's equations. Uh, you charge your particles going in, and then depending on how much they weigh, they'll kind of go through that system in different times and they'll be perturbed different amounts by the electric field. Um, okay, so you can basically, you can uncover the structure of a compound, uh, you know, you can say you, you put the substance through the mass spectrometer and based on a signature that it produces, you can kind of reverse engineer what uh, exactly the, the atoms are that are in that molecule. Yeah, yeah if, if, if not atoms, the, the kind of clumps of, of particles. Um, and so for, for us, we would be looking at... Um, you know, they're peptides or, or fragments of, of peptides. Uh, and then it becomes kind of like this uh, library pattern matching where you take 
uh, your signal that comes out of the mass spectrometer and you have to build that back into what the input was. Um, so that kind of reverse pattern match um, or reverse lookup. Uh, that was the type of stuff we were we were doing in our in our system. So we were using um, at the time uh, an open source tool called OpenSwaf, uh, which was developed out of the University of Zurich, um, and we were putting that inside Docker containers. We were running that on Kubernetes. Uh, Kubeflow didn't exist at the point we were building that out, and so we'd uh, written our own kind of workflow engine. Uh, that was creating Argo workflow YAML specs directly. Um, and we were running a hybrid cluster where we had on-premise compute and we had uh, bursting capability out into AWS. Um, and yeah, so each each sample of the, the cancer would produce a couple of gigabytes of, of raw data. Um, and our ultimate goal was to to run all these kind of pattern matching and basically get to the point where we could say um, what the um, basically what the amount of each peptide uh, and then that can get rolled up into the amount of each protein existed within that sample. Um, and we would effectively produce an Excel spreadsheet or a CSV file with that information in it. Uh, and that is then what would go to our data science team. Uh, and the data science team would then start to look at, you know, a lot of what you would see in, in traditional genomics research, so unsupervised clustering and um, you know, all of that kind of stuff, lots of challenges around normalization and um, kind of experimental effects. And I think that, that was one of the really interesting um, kind of developments for me moving from uh, a bit more fundamental sort of mechanical engineering simulation stuff into biology was um, reproducibility is very, very different. Um, Biological systems um, have a lot more variance uh, experimentally mm -hmm. than mm -hmm. what you would get out of um, maybe more sort of what, or the, certainly the, the worlds that I was used to. Um, and I'd say that that was probably one of the, the things that I, uh, that led me a lot to the way I think about MLOps and, and the way that I think about uh, correctness uh, in these systems. Um, and it kind of started at first light and then moved into. Uh, what I was doing at Procan, um, and that is this idea that um, that kind of correctness of results needs to be a first class citizen, um, and somewhat surprisingly, that isn't always true uh, in in the way that people think about data science problems. They can think a lot about um, you know getting results, and you can think about monitoring over time, and and maybe you think about correctness in aggregate, um, but actually for a lot of these things. Uh, and, and where I see kind of AI going in future, uh, it, it's no longer sufficient to think about the accuracy of results or the correctness of results uh, in aggregate. You have to start thinking about the correctness of results for individual samples. Um, and mm -hmm. I think that's that's quite an interesting uh, quite an interesting thing uh, that we we as a as a field need to to start putting a bit more effort into to thinking about. Um, I kind of remember back to the first light days. We had a um, an independent scientific review of the work we were doing. And one of the profs uh, who was involved in that was the um, head of experimental physics, I think his title was at Imperial College. Uh, and he basically self-described his career as being devoted to building experiments that broke numerical models. Mm. <laughs> and I think that's, a, that's something that uh, I think AI could do generally. Uh, a little bit better is is to think specifically about how to build experiments to really test the edges of um, the edges of the models and, and stuff like that. Cool. Yeah. Great points uh, about you know where we could be making strides not only with artificial intelligence research but specifically in medicine towards this kind of personalized uh, individual level um, medical. Um, analysis um, as opposed to just a, an aggregate level uh, which obviously people are being treated um, not in aggregate but you get treated as an individual and so you know your particular uh, genetics your particular proteome your particular cancer can be uh, critical to how you respond to a given treatment and so yeah some really great points there and yet another incredible you know over your career you've applied you know, to kind of summarize 
what you've been doing over the years. You've been using data, you've been using large scale data in a lot of cases um, that is um, you know, made practical by clean code, software engineering principles, um, and apply these ideas to, um, to study very difficult numerical problems across uh, brain imaging or, or, or you know, neuro, neuroscientific disabilities, across fusion power, across cancer, and now massive, massive scale machine vision from aerial imagery. And so, and, you know, I knew we were going to have an incredibly interesting conversation. And uh, if anything, you overshot the mark. <laughs> um, because, yeah, I mean, it's just, a, you know, we could, we could have talked about any one of those four examples for an entire hour long episode. Um, so thank you for giving us kind of the, the, the summary level of it, as well as specifically how software and data science tools are useful in those spaces. Um, so to start to move towards the conclusion of the episode, what do you see are big applications of artificial intelligence that could uh, materialize over the coming years? You've seen machine learning techniques, data simulation techniques applied in all these different uh, cutting edge fields. Yeah, so you probably have a unique perspective on what's possible in the future. Yeah, look, so, so I think it's, um, it's kind of inevitable that AI moves the way of, of other numerical science applications and that it moves from kind of bespoke R&D into um, more of like an industrial engineering type setup um, where, you know, you have some kind of easy to understand, easy to use user experience um, that really hides away a lot of the technical detail of what's happening behind the scenes. Uh, and in many ways, this is kind of already happening. We're seeing some of the big tech uh, companies provide kind of products with simple to use APIs and, and stuff like that. Um, and that, that's kind of following the, the practices of, of things like uh, commercially available uh, fluid dynamic software or commercially available uh, CAD systems with finite element analysis and, and stuff like that. Uh, CAD, for those who don't know, uh, computer-aided design. Um, you know, so if you're a typical structural engineer uh, and you're trying to figure out whether your bridge design is going to stand up, uh, you're sitting inside your CAD application, you've got your design there, uh, and you can run a bunch of simulations uh, to figure out you know, whether the stress is handled in, in the right way. The chances are that people running those types of simulations uh, might have a, a superficial understanding of, of what's going on under the hood, but the chances are they, they don't really understand, nor do they need to understand the, the technical detail about what's going on. Or what's going on. Uh, and they certainly aren't uh, necessarily going to be the people that are, you know, sitting in university environments designing the latest and greatest like high order method or whatever the case may be. They're using the tool to, to get stuff done in the real world. Um, and I, I see that AI is gonna go in a similar direction. There's going to be uh, a bunch of stuff like the whole no code movement uh, and stuff like that where uh, researchers and product companies are uh, building the algorithms behind the scenes uh, and then putting a nice user interface on top of that. Um, but I think what's really interesting with, with that, and I, I do believe that is the inevitable future, um, but there's a, there's a big risk, uh, which I haven't seen a lot of people talk about. Um, and that's uh, if we take industrial engineering, there, there's some fairly deep uh, professional standards and those professional standards have, have real teeth. Um, you know, if a chartered engineer signs off on a bridge design uh, and that bridge falls down, you know, there is real tangible professional liability uh, right. to that engineer. Yeah. Um, but we're not really talking yet about that in the AI space. So what happens if you know someone builds a a product that sits on top of uh, I don't know CT scans, uh, which tells the doctor yes no this person has a tumor. You know wh whatever kind of simple interface that that's going to end up with. Um, at the moment, it feels like uh, the cost of being wrong is is quite low in in AI. Uh, and I 
think maybe that's partly because we're we're coming out of this world of data science being used in aggregate where often the cost of being wrong is also in aggregate so you know if you're using ai to trade shares losing out on one deal is not a big thing it's only if you lose out on all your deals that it becomes a big thing yeah, um, yeah. or serving the wrong ad once doesn't make any difference at all exactly um and so how how we how we flip as an industry um and it's not going to be all use cases uh so you know all of those types of examples that we just talked about they're going to continue to exist um but the cases where we are predicting results for an individual thing and where the cost of being wrong on that individual thing are tangible important decisions um uh, it's going to be really interesting to see how we tackle that as a field yeah yeah really great points i love that perspective um yeah huge amount of potential coming but definitely ethical uh considerations that we need to account for uh you know the medical example is a perfect example you you know the the physician attending physician does a proteome test takes your temperature <laughs> and then puts you know and the machine says okay well it's this kind of cancer you need this kind of treatment and then it's wrong the patient dies uh and maybe there was something there was something wrong with the way it was programmed or the way that um the model you know, was trained you know it wasn't prepared for this particular kind of edge case and in fact it it provides exactly the opposite of what you should be doing in this in this edge case scenario and a life was lost um so who is who is liable um so yeah yeah really good points brett we could easily talk for hours more but um uh <laughs> in the interests of uh of wrapping up the episode at some point. Um, I've got one last question for you, which is if you have a book recommendation for us. Uh, I, I have to admit that I um, don't have a lot of time for, for reading at the moment. I have a young uh, young kid that I'm constantly chasing around. But uh, <laughs> what that means is that when I do read something that sticks in my head as a, as a good good book, uh, it, you don't it have does stick there. Children's and, Bedtime Story? that you can recommend I have <laughs> for the young of those and, and, and I'm not, <laughs> not going to recommend where's spot to your listeners um, <laughs> well, you just did <laughs> uh no i the the last book i i remember reading that really lodged in my brain was um was the martian uh it's such a it's quite short uh it's quite a cool take on um yeah, you know, what would happen if uh, someone got stuck on Mars? How they would survive? Uh, for those who uh, are interested, it's it's really well done. It's uh, it's pretty well researched. Uh, it is somewhat plausible uh, for a sci-fi book, uh, and it's it's just really well written, entertaining read. This was turned into a major motion picture, was it not? It certainly was. Matt Damon, <laughs> science in the out of things. <laughs> All right. And then Brett, clearly you are a brilliant guy accomplishing an absurd amount, a, a, you know, empowering data science with machine learning operations across vast fields, fusion energy, cancer. Um, listeners are going to want to be able to follow you. What should they do? Uh, what's the best place? Uh, so I'm, I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, I'm on Twitter. I'm not hugely active on either. Um, but, uh, but that's definitely the, the place to, to get in touch. Uh, so most of my Twitter feed is, is spam about, um, about fusion. So, uh, <laughs> nice. Well, that sounds pretty come good. There, that was definitely come there for, for retweets. Yeah, it was definitely an interesting part of the conversation for me. I will be, uh, on the lookout for those. Of course, I already follow you, but, uh, yeah, you know, fusion in particular, it's like a really exciting socially, you know, game changer for, for all, for everyone on the planet. And so I, I really do hope that's coming soon and I'll be watching your Twitter feed to get a clearer picture of Len. Um, thank you so much, Brett, for being on the show and hopefully sometime we can catch up with you again in the future. Can't wait, mate. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Man, did I ever enjoy catching up with Brett today. I hope you enjoyed the fascinating, wide-ranging conversation as much as I did. 
In today's episode, Brett expanded my mind on how the AI output systems function of an AI systems organization can fit alongside the model R&D and the model systems teams to maximize the productivity of a massive scale machine vision company like Nearmap. He also covered the Kubernetes, Kubeflow, and Kafka tools that Brett and his team of machine learning engineers deploy to create an efficient pipeline of AI pipelines and save up to 80% of their compute cost by using AWS spot instances. He talked about the GeoPandas library that he recommends for working with geospatial data in Python. He talked about how normal pressure hydrocephalus presents like dementia, but if correctly diagnosed early, can be treated completely and reverse cognitive impairments. And he let us know how critical machine learning operations, for example, by leveraging Docker and Kubernetes, is for efficiently working on huge healthcare data sets like cancer proteome data. As always, you can get all the show notes, including the transcript for this episode, the video recording, any materials mentioned on the show, the URLs for Brett's LinkedIn and Twitter profiles, as well as my own social media profiles at www.superdatascience.com slash 533. That's www.superdatascience.com slash 533. If you enjoyed this episode, I'd greatly appreciate it if you left a review on your favorite podcasting app or on the Super Data Science YouTube channel. I also encourage you to let me know your thoughts on this episode directly by adding me on LinkedIn or Twitter and then tagging me in a post about it. Your feedback is invaluable for helping us shape future episodes of the show. All right. Thanks to Ivana, Mario, Jaime, JP, and Kirill on the Super Data Science team for managing and producing another mind-blowing episode for us today. Keep on rocking it out there, folks, and I'm looking forward to enjoying another round of the Super Data Science podcast with you very soon.